Now that we have some basic information on how water wheels work, we can take a closer look at each one of the four mills. Starting with, High Mill. This field has been part of the farm, for at least 500 years. In less than three years time, the field will disappear, as new dwellings are built. This is what High Mill looks like in June 2021, it is abandoned and derelict. The buildings date back to at least 1800, and operated, as a corn mill and farm, until 1928. In 1928 it was no longer viable to produce flour from grinding corn, and the mill part of the farm was closed. The farm continued to operate as a dairy farm, under the ownership of the Pickering family, until it was sold in the 1980s. From the late 1980s it was owned by Roger Steele who used some of the land for static caravans. During the last 15 years the land was again sold, this time to a property developer, and today new buildings are being constructed. The farm buildings themselves are grade 2 listed, and have been bought by a private individual, who has submitted plans to convert the old buildings and preserve the facade and style. So, how exactly did High Mill work? We are now going to turn back time, and take a look at the last 250 years. Ouch, banged my head. That flipping hurt, it's okay, I am alright. There are limitations to just how far back we can go to trace the history of all the mills. These three dates have been vital in our research. 1771, we have an enclosure map, sometimes called a tithe map. 1852, a detailed ordnance survey of the area. 1892, an even better detailed ordnance survey map. Scorby is first recorded in 1086 as Scolaby. The word has been traced back to an old Scandinavian personal name of a man called Scally. By, is added which, in this case means a farmstead or village. This is the 1771 map, and we see that the land that the mill stands on is owned, or rented by W. Johnson. These fields are owned by, Dean and Glebe. Glebe is an old English name for a plot of land that is normally connected to the church. The two major landowners in England were the Crown and the church. So W. Johnson has his farm, and mill, next to fields owned by the church. This blue line is Scorby Beck. And the light blue line is Cowworth Beck. And finally we have the mill race. The mill race, Cowworth and Scorby Beck, are all constants that are more or less in the same place today as they were back in 1771. Although this part has changed, and there is a bit of a mystery of what was actually there. We will try and figure it out as we explore the area. We will start with the 1892 map. This is exactly how the mill was being supplied with water from the dam at Cowworth Beck. This system was in use from at least 1860 to 1960, 100 years. At this point, Cowworth was dammed. Excess water ran over the dam, down this spillway, and was sent back into Scorby Beck. This mill pond was kept topped up. The water stored here, ran inside the building and turned the water wheel. When the pond needed topping up, a sluice gate was opened at the dam and water ran in a pipe that was underground for a short while. It then discharged into the mill race and on towards the mill pond. If we look back to the same map, 40 years earlier, we find that there was no dam, although the mill race is still in the same place. This pipe appears to have once supplied the mill race and also holds clues to how things worked in 1852. It crossed Cow Wath, at this point, and also further up Scorby Beck. This is the pipe that Steve and his mates would play on when they were a lot younger. Maps contain an amazing amount of detail, but to get a better understanding of what an area looks like, it is vital to have photos, or film footage, of the surroundings. This map shows hatched lines, they inform us that we are looking at a bank, or small hill, basically a section of the land that is higher than its surroundings. 
We will now try to explain how everything worked, using, maps, graphics and video footage, taken between 2020 and 2023. Researching this part of the project has thrown up a bit of a mystery. So far, over a six-month period, Steve has been down to the area several times, looking for clues and trying to piece together bits of information. The remains of the dam on Cow Wharf can be found opposite the bottom of East Lane. That dam has been there, in various forms, since 1860. On this map, 1852, you can see that a sluice, conduit and mill race are shown further down Cow Wharf and are a lot closer to Scorby Beck. In 1898 though, the dam is a lot further upstream. So what's going on? Our starting point is this Ordnance Survey map from 1852. The map, as you can see here, shows the following. Cowwoff, Sluice, Conduit and Mill Race. Today, and back in 1860, Cowwoff discharges here into Scorby Beck, and it has followed this exit point for at least 150 years. But in 1852, part of it discharged here, via a weir and sluice gate and also at the other end of the mill via the tail race. This is not the exact same overflow but it is the exact location, what you are looking at is the overflow for the Yorkshire water installation that is directly above. Whether it is 200 years ago, or last week, to get water to run into the mill race the water level of cow wharf has to be raised at least 6 metres, that is 20 feet in old money. Clearly in 1898 it was the dam that held back the water and raised the level, but in 1852, how did they achieve this? These marks denote a slope, bank or hill. Notice that they extend from the Condorit, on the west side, to the mill race on the east side, and there are no breaks in the slopes. We are as sure as we can be that Cowwoff was dammed at this point, and the water diverted into the mill race. The dam would have been earth rocks and perhaps some sort of timber frame to hold the materials in place. This pipe is an aqueduct and first appears on the map of 1898. The pipe is in the exact same place today as it was in 1898. Yorkshire Water class it as a CSO, combined sewage overflow. Yes, it is carrying raw sewage although we doubt that it started life as a sewage pipe. Interestingly enough, it also follows the line of the old Condorit. As you can see the pipe is between, 6 and 10 meters, above the bed of Cow Woff, and this is roughly the same height that a dam would have been in 1852. This will give you a rough idea of what it may have looked like, looking up from Scorby Beck. The bottom of the dam would have been, a few feet above the river and a bit boggy, because it looks as if the spring was seeping water back into Scorby Beck in this area. This is looking down Cow Woff, towards Scorby Beck, and again you can see the aqueduct pipe, which gives you a good idea of the height of the dam. The dam, might have looked something like this. If we look carefully at the land behind where the dam was, we see that there is a curved feature of the land, and also a lower level. This same feature can be seen behind the remains of the replacement dam further upstream. It was probably created from the water that was held behind the dam. You can only really appreciate this feature, by standing at the side of the river and looking around to get the perspective. When Steve was there, he was not alone. A couple of deers ran past him. So the dam water would build up, to the level of the mill race, flow along the race and any excess would be diverted down the weir into Scorby Beck. The weir would have been designed as an overflow, and would probably not need any attention. The water would then travel onto the mill, and form the mill pond. From here it turned the wheel and the spent water was sent back to Scorby Beck, a few yard further downstream. It looks like this was where the tail race discharged back into Scorby Beck. To the left we have a conduit. Now, this is the same as a mill race, a man-made ditch to carry water. It is called a conduit because it diverts water from one place to another. As you can see the conduit is shown to start here, and ends by running back into Cow Wharf, via a sluice gate. The sluice will most likely have looked like this, a simple plank, that can be raised to allow a faster flow of water, into the mill race when needed. 
The new sea cut that was finished in 1806, allowed a greater flow of water down Scorby Beck, and several articles state the corn mills took advantage of this extra water flow. It is pretty obvious that this is the case with this mill. Regardless of how long the conduit has been there, the water level would have still have to be raised from Scorby Beck to allow sufficient flow to reach the sluice. The only realistic possibility on how they could have achieved this was to dam Scorby Beck, create a weir, and tap the water flow. Here, in 1852, you can see a reference to piling and three weirs. We think that it was at this point where a dam and weir had been constructed to supply water to the conduit. Despite extensive research, we could not find any other explanation. If you have watched part one of the video series, you will be aware of the Great Flood of 1857. Scorby Beck is said to have risen 15 feet higher than normal, the flood waters created a huge amount of damage. The storm, and flood, lasted 24 hours, destroying buildings and bridges. It is the reason why we do not see anything today of the first cow wharf dam and weirs. They were washed away by the storm, and not replaced. The corn mill would have been put out of action when the dam was destroyed, and we think that the new dam would have been built, not long after the flood, although this time further up Cow Wharf. So, the new dam was built here around 1858. To get the stored water back into the mill race, a connecting pipe was run underground from the dam to the mill race. Surplus water would flow over the dam and back into Cow Wharf. The exit point of Cow Wharf now joins Scorby Beck in the same place as it does today. The conduit was never replaced, the loss of the conduit would have severely reduced the water flow to the mill. This aqueduct may well have been originally constructed to supply that extra water. In 1898, the pipe discharged into the head of the mill race. The earliest logical date for its construction would be late 1850s. The aqueduct crosses Scorby Beck at the exact point of the source of the old conduit. This gives us another reason to think that it was designed to divert water to the mill race. As already mentioned, there are no records of when and why this pipe was built, but we think that it originally took water from the weir at Newby Bridge, and followed this line. After 1852, there were changes in the area. The big change came in 1885 when the railway was extended to Whitby, via Scorby village. A few yards upstream from the source of the conduit, the railway viaduct was built from 1870, and the line opened the 16th of July 1885. There were very few buildings in Newby, and Scorby before the railway was constructed. As the area developed, new roads were built and the drains for those roads would have been sent into Scorby Beck. As you can see here, 1898, there are no buildings in and around High Mill Farm, and the nearest property is the station. The OS map of 1914 also shows no new buildings. Houses started to appear after 1918, and it is very likely that the drains from these houses were connected to the aqueduct. Up until the end of World War I, the aqueduct was supplying rainwater and river water into the mill race. The mill ceased to operate about eight years later, and the aqueduct was extended to become a sewer, bypassing the mill race. This present-day map shows the line of the saw extension. The untreated water being sent along new pipes to the sea outfall in Jackson's Bay. When the mill part of the farm closed, water was still feeding into the mill pond, which was now used for fishing and also to supply water for livestock. On the 1928 map the mill pond has been filled in. Water still ran into the mill building, from the mill race, but it was now in an underground pipe. The dam continued to supply water along the mill race, until after World War II. The 1958 map shows that the mill race is no longer in use and is nothing more than a stone-filled channel. Despite the dam, and sluice gate, 
being constructed of concrete they were frequently damaged by storm water. The last attempt to repair the dam was in 1962-63. The repairs didn't last long, and it was never repaired again. In 1968 Steve was 13 years old and spent a lot of time exploring Scorby Beck. He clearly remembers playing on a concrete structure that was built on Cow Wharf, he had no idea what it was. While researching this project, he posted a request to our Facebook group to see if any of our members had any information about the farm and mill race. One chap, Terry Colley, answered. Steve and Terry went back to the farm to explore and investigate further. We've got Sunday morning. Again, it seems to be I spend all my Sunday mornings on there. Now we've got Terry, and you used to work here in... Right? 1959. It was up to 1963 when you packed up, was it? 1960, yeah. Well, between 62 and 63, yeah. yeah. Yep. And if you were still here, Terry, this wouldn't have been built on. You'd have been. It would not. Yeah. No, if things had gone the way I thought they were going to go, yeah. they wouldn't have. Had, they wouldn't be there because it would still be a farm. What was this feeling? Was it just? Oh it... no! They, oh no! This we used to we used to go crops in here. This and the, the field beyond it went all the way down to to where the yeah. to, to where the dam was. Yeah, this was always a hay meadow. This one oh. farm farm track has not altered one little bit. No. This was always here. In fact when we rebuilt the dam, I remember we had an old grey Fergie and I remember hitching the cement mixer up to the old grey Fergie and carting it up here, Will Pickering driving and I was stood on yeah. back at <laughs> So oh, the, it was the Pickering family wasn't it? It was the Pickering oh, family, yeah. yeah. George, Will, Nora and Mother. When we used to lurk into the side, somebody in this field down here came down and we knew somebody was the farmer, so it must be it would be George Pickering. But we to this day I swore Blandy had a gun. I think he had a shotgun. Uh, I don't know, he, he was he was a strange guy because he was always dressed as a farmer you would you would recognise as a farmer. Yeah. He had he had like um calf trousers on, spats down there, yeah. a waistcoat and yeah. he always wore a trilby. Yeah. Now we wore that every day of the week apart from a Sunday morning. Yeah. And on a Sunday morning he used to get dressed up in all this finery and he had a walking stick and he used to walk from the farm to the bridge yeah. and then back again. Might have been his walking stick, but yeah, when it you might have been his walking stick. When you're kids yeah. like you just uh, you see a farmer coming out waving things and think, yeah, yeah he's got a shot. I never I never remember him shooting at all. No. I never remember no, him. I don't think he would have done like but I know he chased us off, but we weren't doing any harm, we were, no. we were actually on the side of the back. Some of them are down here because I'm having a good walk. I have got a load of footage of it because I've, I've said I've had a good walk down. That's a bit further down. There's a bit where it's um, all, all circular and concrete around, you know, which is probably some of your handiwork. It will be. Because the old dam, of course, was built out of stone. Yeah. So there'll be, there was a load of old stone and we connected up with this. I mean, George was in the street, he had this great idea. All that summer we spent, he shoveling concrete. And uh, anyway, got it all done. And first foot of winter, <laughs> once again, didn't think about reinforcing rods in or anything like that, just pure concrete. Nothing it's to pound. There's some power in the uh, water, so the beach down there is the slope. Right. There's the fence. Ah, that's, that's, the, that's the fence there, and the, the old sluice is just there, look, you can just see the yeah, concrete. Yeah, now. well this is this is where we were, this is it. Yeah. So how did you get into this then? Well, I, I walked around there, and I walked down the back, which was a bit of a task, but you can get down here so far as well. Yeah, there's your uh, handiwork there. Yeah, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. I don't know where this water's coming from, we've had no rain for about a month. <laughs> Well, that, yeah. you can see there where there's been some sort of uh, pipe yeah. at the bottom. That's yeah. where water must have come through an old floor. We're on the back. I mean, you can't get on there without well. Listen, I've got a picture of it. But at the back on there, there's a hole at the bottom, and I think the pressure of the water went up and along. Well, certainly a good 20 feet deep is that, and yeah. I remember that. I remember yeah. it. Um, to me, this this bed wasn't running then as much as it is now. No, there's a lot more water, but. 
see what I remember. We'd have come from down here, from the street down here, and a lot of these houses were still being built or not built properly. And I just remember the race coming down in steps. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And then um, we were hacking about trying to break things. Yeah. So I think all that old rubble there is can't rebuild, can't rebuild that on top of that. Yeah. We had planks across to bring it back to bring concrete over here. <laughs> you didn't use a level then? Hey. You didn't use the spirit <laughs> level? <laughs> no, no, no. no. No, this is a solid stone. Yeah. There's bits there, look, bits of... Yeah, yeah. And it came right across to here, you know. Yeah. Um, it was quite, it was a hell of a structure. Well, I would say all that down there. I mean, you can't get in there, but there's... Um, they spring all sorts on there. Oh, they'll be, they'll be storage stone, you know, yeah. That'll have been like the waterfall yeah, part, yeah, the weir yeah, part. Yeah. Must have been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think now, looking back, I think if I remember, this part of it here was, a, was, was deep. And I think there was a sluice grave on top of the waterfall, you yeah. can say. And that you could regulate what water you had in the other side of yeah. In this, this end. And that end was used to feed the mill. Yeah. I think that pipe at the bottom was like, it's like a siphon pipe. Yeah. It's the bottom. The pressure would have sent it. Yeah. yeah. So Terry's going to have a look at the top of this old sluice gate in which he mixed the concrete for. Terry's handiwork, 1959-1960. Even before the Beatles were famous. I mean that bit's done quite well but uh, the rest of it suffered. So what sort of guarantee did you give for this work then? Are you still valid? What? Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's only 50 year NHBC house guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> Thing of all, you didn't sign it, did you? Hey, did you sign it? No, but I'll tell you what I did do. I mean, even bits like this, everything went in. Yeah. It's a snake, you know. And I remember being a young, a well, young lad, and we lived in there, the Avenue. Just a bit further up, there was a, a family called the Ibbotsons. Oh yeah. And um, Alan of this, he was a he was a builder of brick and we used to knock about with him at the time, he was oh, no, just about an apprentice, coming to the whole end of his apprenticeship. And he said uh, he was on I was on about it, mixing concrete. And I said if we uh, if we throw stuff in, does it affect the strength of the concrete? Well he said it depends where it was. And I remember throwing an old cigarette packet in. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that would bother me, but I remember this cigarette packet. Yeah. you got a bit of fancy work on here. You'll be careful you don't fall off there. Oh, careful, careful, you need some scaffolding up there. Now you can see this back side of it. Go down at the bottom. Yeah, I'll see if it would be a good 20 foot, I mean. You know, health and safety. It's all coming across here because that dip was always yeah. there. Yeah. So coming across here on, on a couple of old yeah. planks was... This is where the mill pond was in 1928. In 2020 the area has been dug out, ready for a new water storage tank that will serve the properties being built. This hill was always here, it was always like this. Yeah. And then the, the ditch started somewhere about here, as I remember. And it was quite it was quite a deep pronounced ditch. Yeah. And it went all the way around to the farm. And as it approached the farm before just before it hit where the caravan site was, it more or less turned from almost being like a beck yeah. into a proper mill room. Like a little extra estuary, wasn't it? Yeah. It went straight through that. But you think when they were digging at excavators, somebody would have taken a bit of time to uh, 
but then again, they the must have come across it. They must have done, yeah. yeah. We can actually see the mill now. But before there was this big pile of earth, so we've dug it out, we've had our shovels out and shifted it. And directly there, between them two chimney stacks, you see a bit of a gap. That's where the water came in. So it went, the water came in there on that, uh, yeah. that building there. Yeah. The good thing about the video, I can put little arrows and things and point to them rather than trying to explain it. So. Looks like the mill race. Yeah. So what, what was all this then? This was These just were all the farm buildings, all all outbuildings. That was a cow shed. That was a, a shed in there where you see calves. This would be a big muck in here. I remember sat on that step there. You see, eat my lunch that there. <laughs> Should have brought some sandwich with you. Go sit there and eat your lunch. Yeah. Should have brought me flask. Yeah, look at it. Feeding by is still there. Oh yeah, so this was all for cows, is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, troughs. All stone uh, slabs for shutters. Yeah, that's an old mill wheel, isn't it? Oh, two, three. three. Okay, you know, I mean, all such as that will be gone forever on this town. Well, that would have, I think if the people who bought it, they probably, uh, probably want to try and keep some of it, what the? Used to keep doings in here. Used to keep milk pans in here. Well, I think the lever just. Yeah, the Bedford it was. Yeah. Ah, oh, cranky. Cranky old shoes. When you stood outside and you look, you think, oh, this must have been the mill part, but it's not. It's obviously. Yeah, look at that old chain, brown cow's neck. In there. <laughs> I wonder how many times I used it. Nothing cow outside. I actually got one when I was here. There's a drinking trough. Yeah. We had pipe water to it, and it had a, it had like a flange on it, and the cow would push the nose in, and it wouldn't valve, and water would come into the trough. Right. Might still be some up there. And all that was uh, really been supplied by Mill Race once it yeah, water. Yeah, it wasn't one time until we got pipe water in. That was yeah, way through, that was old toilet. That was a bog, orchard in here. I was I was tried to chill a kill a chicken in here, only been here a few weeks and Nora said I want a chicken. I want his neck pulling. Well right. I could not pull it good enough. <laughs> Oh, it's getting here. The mill, mill wheel was inside there, and this this was there's the belts. Oh, oh yeah. That's um. It was this, there was stairs up there, but they've gone. So the, the, it, it turned the turned all this lot, and this was where all the milling went on. Had to be little in them days. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, cracky, solid that right now. The old belt still left. Right, I bet that's not moved since I was here. But obviously, like you say, it's here. here. And it's boarded up down there. Maybe when they've uh, come to develop it, we might see. Straight through there, see a bit more what's going on. The old stable there, we had two horses, two big shire horses. They took me round here, this was all Ken Clothes walled off this farmyard. They took me in there into a cow shed and we walked through and through into the stable. It's 
still see air racks. And they took me in there and there was these two bloody great shire horses up there. And though I'm massive, I was only down here like I'm looking up. <laughs> and he says, whatever you do, lad, if you come to work for me, if I take you on, he says, you look after these two horses, he says. Because I love them, he says. Yeah, so that was a stable. It used to be a beautiful farmyard, you know, it's yeah. straight down to the back and it was, yeah. it was the most... It was well, you can see it, can't you? You yeah. can see it picturesque. I can understand that woman wanted to buy it. Um, I bet it was fantastic when it's done. So what do you reckon them? Do you think well, this should be it last? Yeah, it's about desolate now, but a bit of luck and uh, make a good job of whatever they're going to do with it, going by the plans, it, it could be very nice. But I don't think I'll get down again, there's no point really. You know. Would you like to see it when it's been redone? Uh, well, yeah, it might be worth it. Might be worth a look down. You know, I mean, if these units are for sale, you never know. I might buy one. <laughs> that would be a turn up for the book. Would it? Yeah. Before we leave High Mill Farm, we still have a couple of things to mention. This is a memorial dedicated to Kevin Dunwell, who spent most of his working life on the farm. His time there must have been after Terry had left, because Terry was the only, non-family member, employed by the Pickering family in 1963. The new owner of the farm and mill buildings, Carrie Gledhill, has been in touch. She grew up in Harwood Dale and the new development will be her forever home. The new plans are designed to make the buildings suitable for her family needs and also to bring these derelict structures back to life. Carrie has described herself as, a sympathetic and history-living owner. It is really good news to know that she is trying to save and incorporate, where possible, the history of the mill and farm buildings. Despite the farm, and mill, being Grade 2 listed, they were due to be pulled down and, lost forever. So we must take this opportunity to say a big thank you to Carrie for saving an important part of our local history.